My life is in your hands, according to God's grace, giving us the ability to serve Him. That's why we exist. My special guest this evening is Dr. Van Johnson. Van is the Dean of Masters Pentecostal Seminary, as well as the adjunct professor of New Testament at Tyndale Seminary located in Toronto. He's also a good friend. He was one of my professors as I was studying for my Masters of Theology. I am so honored and privileged to have Van with us here tonight on It's Your Call. Van, welcome. Rob, it's wonderful to be with you tonight. Well, I know you're a busy man, but I greatly appreciate you taking the time. Van, you know, you're a dean, you're a professor, you're a teacher. Just give our viewing audience for a moment kind of a, a scope of what your expertise in. What is it you lecture? What is it you teach on? I do both New Testament studies, focusing on the Gospels, and some in Acts and some in Paul. And then because I am associated with Master's Pentecostal Seminary, I'm also teaching uh, Pentecostals, those who are training for ministry or those who are already in Pentecostal ministry. Hmm. Well, Van, um, I, I'm interested in your commentary because as a teacher functioning in the body of Christ, um, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, uh, whether you believe it's the five or the fourfold, a lot of people have trouble with a couple of those functions in the body of Christ, the apostle and the prophet. Sure. But can you take a few moments and um, just give us your commentary on what Paul is teaching about in Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12, dealing specifically as well with the apostle and the prophet. Okay, so let me start a little bit more broadly here. Paul has three different chapters where he deals with spiritual gifts. So you've got two lists in 1 Corinthians 12. You have one list in Romans 12, and none of these lists are exactly the same. And then you come to Ephesians 4, which is the only list of the three where he specifies certain gifts, the four or the five, and we'll talk about uh, the difference between the four and the five. Uh, this is the only place where he says that these gifts prepare others for works of service. Mm -hmm. So w without calling them necessarily leadership gifts, because so many of the gifts involve being a leader in some capacity, uh, these, these stand out for Paul. The, the, the second reason, um, the second thing I want to say by way of uh, brief commentary here is, we do have difficulty figuring out exactly what these gifts are because Paul tends to talk about them to a group of people that he has already instructed uh, about them. So when he is writing to the Corinthians, when he's writing to the Ephesians, he presumes that they know what these gifts are. So the nature of his explanation uh, to them about what he's wanting them to hear is not so much, do you understand what these gifts are, but his explanation is, do you realize how important mm. these gifts are? Okay, so... When we come to Ephesians 4.11, then, we have, we have these names without explanation. Uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, uh, pastors, and teachers. So, why four as opposed to five? Grammatically in the Greek, there's something that connects the last two, pastors and teachers. Mm -hmm. So, some think that Paul is imagining this as a dual role. Uh, I, I think there's something to that. I think that Paul cannot imagine a pastor who is not also a teacher, mm -hmm. because Christianity is about truth, and you can't pastor people or shepherd them unless you know how to explain the truth. Mm -hmm. but, probably, but probably Paul knows of some teachers who aren't pastors. Right. And certainly today it's very common with colleges and seminaries. Yeah. Okay, so we either, got, we either have uh, four or five. Okay, so let's come to apostles and prophets. Uh, it, it seems as if Paul is understanding that there is an exclusive use of apostles, which is probably what he means in Ephesians 2.20, when he talks about the church being built on the foundation of apostles and prophets. Uh, he's probably referring to, in particular, the twelve that uh, were with Jesus, and then uh, he includes himself in it. So because he doesn't give a definition here, Mm -hmm. He talks about his own apostleship in 1 Corinthians 9, right at the beginning. In fact, when he's, when he's speaking to the Corinthians, a congregation that uh, he established, he, he's, facing, he's facing some issues there, one of them being whether he has the authority that he says he does. So he's, it's interesting. We, we get him talking about what he understands an apostle to be 
because he feels as if he's being challenged by it. So mm-hmm. 1 Corinthians uh, 9, uh, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Okay, so let's stop there. Paul understood that one of the stipulations for being a New Testament apostle, this, this restricted usage of it, was that they were, uh, that this individual was an eyewitness of Jesus. And Paul says he has seen the Lord, including in his Damascus Road experience. Then he says, are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Now, this is interesting. Hmm. He says to the Corinthians, look, you know I'm an apostle because you are believers. So here's this other aspect of being an apostle, this idea of, of having the truth because it's come through Jesus. The, the idea be, behind being an eyewitness is that they heard the Lord, they saw the Lord, so they become authoritative in the body of Christ. But Paul had this dimension to it. He said, the fact that you are a church when you didn't know Christ before, there was no church before I got there, he says, that's the sign of my apostleship. So Paul attaches to this idea of, of authority, because they were directly connected to Jesus, this idea of breaking new ground, of establishing the gospel in, in a new place. Hmm. So Paul, Paul certainly says, okay, I'm included in that group, and I think he's referring here to the Twelve. But there's a broader use of apostle in the New Testament, too. Hmm. And, uh, in fact, this, this usage uh, includes the name of Paul. It's in Acts 14, where Luke is writing, and he refers to both Barnabas and Paul as apostles. Now, Barnabas is not one of the original twelve, mm-hmm. but but here's a broader usage, and in Acts 14 it has to do with the fact that Paul and Barnabas were were being sent out by a church. They were involved in missionary activity. So once again, here's a broader use of apostle that refers to those who are sent out and doing something for the church. Okay. So I think I think you have two uh, two pretty clear understandings here in the New Testament. Okay, there's this original group, and then there's this broader group that engages in, uh, in missionary Minister, work. Going okay, now what about the prophet? The okay, so prophets uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament have this similarity, that prophecy is this ability to hear clearly what God is trying to say and being able to express it clearly as the Spirit comes upon an individual to uh, usually a group of people. Uh, it, it could be to one person. Mm-hmm. but often to to a group of people. So it's always the word of the Lord coming at a moment to somebody who is receptive. Mm-hmm. And in both cases, Old Testament and New Testament, prophecy, the prophet is engaged in the kind of prophecy that is largely prescriptive rather than predictive. Mm-hmm. So we tend to think of prophecy as predictive because we're thinking of uh, the latest uh, book we've seen on end-time events. So we're mm-hmm. thinking of the prophet as talking about when Jesus is coming back, or in the Old Testament when Messiah was coming. Okay. But most of what the prophets were saying in the Old Testament was not predictive, but prescriptive. In other words, what is God saying to us today about how we should live? Okay. Certainly it's the same in the New Testament. Yeah. But here, here is the difference between the two. In the Old Testament, the prophets had an authority that is quite similar to the New Testament apostles' authority. Mm -hmm. The New Testament apostles, in this restricted sense, having heard the Lord, could say, you know, this is what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament prophets, upon whom the Spirit was coming, had the kind of authority that they could say quite freely, thus saith the Lord. Mm -hmm. And if it turned out for some reason that uh, their words proved to be false, that they had said something that the Lord had not said, then uh, they, were, they were subject to severe punishment. Mm-hmm. But in the New Testament, Paul talks about the prophets judging the other prophets, about the congregation judging the prophecies in 1 Corinthians 14. And so it seems as if you have maybe more of a similarity between uh, the apostles and the Old Testament prophets, and uh, certainly this is not an idea that uh, has just come to me. Uh, others have suggested this too. Mm-hmm. But the New Testament prophet might be a little broader category, without quite the same authority 
because there's no equivalent in the Old Testament for judging right. what Isaiah was saying or what Jeremiah right. was saying. 